That's <laughs> right. Look at me, cat. <laughs> I'm sorry. Hello. Uh, Wait. Hello. Uh, oh. <laughs> Right. Make it happen. Action! Hello! Welcome back! I'm Rosalie, or Ramble on Rosalie, which has a totally different ring to it, because we've been doing Ramble on Rose. But it's available. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> it's what we gotta have to work with, but I'm Rose, technically. That's my dad. We're not cutting. <laughs> we're not cutting, uh, no, and we're, we're doing straight. the great... Divorce, right? <laughs> yes, by C.S. Lewis. Okay, I'll All right. say this thing And back. so well, before we start, I want to confirm that I have not told you anything about this book. It looks bloody. Mm-hmm, yeah. And fiery. And here is a picture of the cover. What? Oh, it's backwards, look. Huh. Oh. <laughs> you, you didn't notice that? <laughs> So you only have a vague understanding other than... I mean, I know it's the divorce, but... Divorce, yes. So... I mean, some of my friends have divorces, but that's all I know. And they make, as it turns out, they make books for uh, mommy and daddy to read to their kids to get them used to the idea that their parents are going to divorce. I mean, I understand it. So mom and I talked. Mom and I talked. And... I'm adopted. <laughs> oh, I just farted. All right. All right. You're, you're not adopted. <laughs> I know that. I and mean, I'm, I, you, with your weird and mom's weird and Taylor's weird, I think you made one weird baby and right, no right. one could make a weirder baby. We're because. normal. No. We're as normal as they come. I think since all of you are normal, you just made like this giant bomb of weird I think that's what happened. All right, so there's a clue here right on the cover of what this book is about. C.S. Lewis. Who, who is that? Why is he a famous author? What has he written? He did poems. No. Oh. He did he Mockingboard? No, not no, the Mockingboard. He did a lot of essays, but he also did novels. He did and I would give you, uh, No. <laughs> that's Poe. You're not even in the ballpark. <laughs> he's a relatively <laughs> modern day writer. I, he, I don't he's gone. Remember. Okay, no, we haven't read it. We ha- uh, that's one clue. All right, secondly, it's about a group of... The, his one, oh most famous God. story is about a it's group of kids okay. that are actually Divorced. staying in... A, no, they're staying in a farmhouse during the war to be safe. And they're explo- like the boxcar children. And they're exploring this but farmhouse. Not, and they, like it. they walk into this giant wardrobe and they go back through the back of the wardrobe and they end he up... Made the Lion, Witch, and the... Not yes! The, I was and the Chronicles of Na- Narnia. Yes! Oh, okay. Yes. I, I was just reading the first book when mm-hmm. I got it off a of cart. Do you know what type of uh, fiction? You know fiction means pulp. it's made up. It's pulp fiction. No. Not pulp fiction. Mm-mm. <laughs> it's the same genre as Harry Potter. Uh, fantasy. Lord. Thank you. <laughs> Obviously, I did not prep her. <laughs> no. Nope. In any way. <laughs> and my brain is dead because it's like 8 p.m. on <laughs> anyway, a Saturday. It's actually later than that, but Dang we'll it. keep going. <laughs> we'll just pretend. Oh, All it's right. 10. So, Whoops. Okay. <laughs> so this I'm is a full book he. Of laughs today. This is a book so he wrote in, in, um, in 1947, actually. It was a long time ago. Mm-hmm. And I read this, uh, somebody recommended it when I was a little bit older than you. In the very first line of his book, he tells you what it's about. He says, Blake wrote of the marriage of heaven and hell, and I have written of their divorce. So they're like hot and cold. Eggs and, well not eggs and mayonnaise. Eggs and mayonnaise. Yeah, yeah, or uh, oil and water. They Oil never mix. Um, vinegar and they never sugar. Mix. So Oil, when I read uh, this, vinegar and sugar. I'll give you um, another confession. When I read this, I wondered. You were divorced. 
Actually, my parents were going through a divorce at the time, so oh. huh. I guess I'll show you up. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, it was painful. It was horrible. Oh, wow. That This yeah. must not made it help. Mm. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm yeah. <laughs> sorry. Right. I'll just assign more chores to you. <laughs> I, so, <laughs> I don't have so any I will on a confess Sunday. <laughs> that at the time I was wondering who William Blake was and what the marriage of heaven and hell was, but we didn't have the internet back then. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't have Google. Uh, and um, you had this handy. But handy but I'll also tell you <laughs> that yes, but I'll also tell you that you've heard a stanza from William Blake's most famous poem. Yes. Many times from me. Yeah. Right. It was even in a book, the uh, science fiction yeah. book. Remember the story? Whatever it was called, it was about spaceman. Mm, it's called the Tiger. Oh yeah. Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forest of the night. What immortal hand or eye dare frame thy fearful symmetry? Why okay. doesn't it rhyme? I don't. Why does that not bother you? I mean, kind of, but like poems sometimes they're not. I mean, it looks right. like it could rhyme a Y and I. So we, I think he was just trying to get away with it. He couldn't think of anything else. Or maybe it was to prove a point. Do you know what he means by fearful symmetry? No. I remember I, I, they had to explain it to me in English. What class. about imagery? Sym symmetry. Do you know what symmetry is? Have you ever heard that word? Yes. It means something is... No, I'm not on that green, green, green uh, level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It means when something is completely balanced on one side or the other. Oh, yeah. Yeah, like the human face, right? Oh, yeah. And it's symmetrical. It, it's not and the tiger's face. I don't face. think mine's a little symmetrical. I think well, mine's I'm, <laughs> very... The, it's one of the things. Mean. You know, you have... Five fingers on each hand, blah, blah, blah. Well, some people uh, don't so have symmetry, five fingers. Symmetry. So, symmetry, um, if you think about it, uh, just by its existence, um, denotes some sort of purpose, right? Right? That you have. There's a reason you have two eyes. There's a reason you have two hands. Yeah. All right? And, uh, you, and the right, reason you have two leggies. So, if one there's to hold purpose... One to right. let it stand. Right. So, it's... if. If there's a divine creator, then there was a plan, right? This master plan to create someone. And what does the Bible say? God created man in his own image. image. And the word Are actually Are you really used... getting religion into this? Yes, we're going full, blo full bore religion. cut this out man for people who don't believe no no it's not this is not what you think okay don't click out right, please no 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 there's it, it. <laughs> you've messed yourself up and gone into Just a hole give me a chance and quit worrying about the ratings okay <laughs> and i care about the people the people are gonna learn something here <laughs> So, yeah. where was that? Oh, yeah. I was just going to make it real fast. Is the image says made in God's image. And the image, the word that was actually used, was talking about the face of man. Symmetry. Right? Not, well, not only that, but that's what I'm saying, the face. And so, when they say they are framed by fearful symmetry, they're talking about the fearful face of the lion with his teeth when he right. growls, right? So... Um, Sadly, the lion is to bed. But anyway, here comes the point. Because he oh, in the poem, uh, right before the last stanza, he actually speaks to the creator. And he says, When the stars threw down their spears and watered heaven with their tears, mm. did he smile his work to see? So did God smile after he was see done, right? And okay. then here's the line. Here's the line. Did he who made the lamb make thee referring to the tiger so you have these two images of the lamb which is right peaceful pure and uh and benevolent and the tiger which is ferocious and you know uh, relentless and unforgiving right mm -hmm. all action and the lamb so the lamb is literally just a lamb, and it does nothing. Right, does no eat, does no eat, harm, and procreate. Right, but no, no, no. But symbolically, symbolically also, it's it, it symbolizes purity, and it was actually used as a sacrifice. 
Yeah. Well, the, remember? Okay. Yeah. So they had that's them what I'm saying. There, the yeah, there's symbolism. Ball. There's symbolism uh, in both of us. So, um, <laughs> and so, did not get slain. And so, slain so Blake's the, Blake's theory or his writings were, were very controversial at the time, which was in the um, early 1800s, late 1700s, right after the French Revolution, and so people were questioning. Um, all sorts of authority and the, the Catholic Church as you know split into the uh, Protestant religion which is what we are you know oh, uh, yeah. you see what I'm saying so so there was this for the first time people were and and he was actually involved in the um, the local press, you know, of, of London at the time, you know, which was kind of like a radical, they were putting out all these wild ideas to foment revolution and all that. They were actually referred to as the devil's press, you know, because they stirred people up. And so, um, Blake wrote this, uh, this kind of series of poems and stories. And, um, what about the marriage of, or divorce? Or I'm getting there. I'm getting there. So his big thing was about the contraries in uh, men and women, uh, mm -hmm. and that um, uh, that um, in this is what he said in the marriage of heaven and hell. He said, "Without contraries, there is no progression. In other words, people don't change." Yeah. Uh, if one is, can I can I speak? Sure. Okay. So if one's very calm and, you know, cool about something and the other one isn't and she's and they're very panicky and stuff, wouldn't they learn from each other or would they? Yeah, but the, he's actually talking about the inner battle going on within each person, the uh... capacity to be both good and evil at the same time. Ah. Yeah, because traditionally religion, you know, the story of Adam and Eve, we're all sinful, right? We have original sin. And so that's what Blake was trying to question. So he said, attraction and repulsion, reason and energy, love and hate are necessary to human existence. From these contraries spring uh, what the religious call good and evil. Good is the passive that obeys reason. Evil is the active springing from energy. And so in his poem, uh, writings, Marriage of Heaven and Hell, he actually goes down to hell uh, and uh, visits and is t gets a tour of it. Well, that's uh, kind of weird. But... It, yeah, and it's interesting. Hell even has a printing press and they're printing out these books and um, they're... Hell is kind of actively involved in fighting good. Do you see what I'm saying? It's almost like in his uh, in his eyes, hell hell is like a part of the world, you know, and it's a constant battle between the two, and the, the combination of those um, is what makes up every man. It's referred to as the duality of man in more modern day. Um, Terms. Right. Yeah, terms. Thank you. Thank You're you. You're welcome. That's so, the only time I can butt in. All right. So anyway, this is where it's going to get interesting, I think. So what, when you think about hell, what images come to your mind? How would you describe it? What do you think it well, would be like? Well, from cartoons. Okay. Tell me what. Okay. Just, it's on the bottom of the world or whatever. Right. And... Very fiery, very mm, red. Of course, got to be fiery. Has lava. Yeah. Um, is very spiky. Spiky. Oh, right, right. It's no place to rest. All right. No. Yeah. And then very uncomfortable. I don't. Well, do you remember? Like that. Remember when we read Edith Hamilton's mythology? Mm -hmm. And um. There are several different heroes that went to hell. There was Hercules yeah. and um, but then there's an Perseus. other picture. There's an other like picture in my mind that I would think of, where it's very gloomy and it's very dark. It's like a cave basically, and it's very cold. yes, no light, right? No the light. opposite, right? And of it's good. very gloomy and yeah. it's just like, I mean, it's kind of light but it's dimly lit. 
so you can kind of see. And how are the people, how do you think the people live there? Do you think they live in constant agony or what? I feel like they live, dang it, the low battery. Oh, because some people (laughs) talk too much. Some people say stuff. (laughs) <laughs> I don't know if they if that recorded, but yeah, no, no, it's still going. That All right. we just blew it again, but keep going. Okay, <laughs> I feel like it'd be very sad and gloomy, and everyone would be very depressed. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. everyone would just live in sadness well, and let, anger and hatred. Let me. I think I've mentioned one of these, but there was a famous Got Milk commercial. Got Milk. Uh, and the guy. Um, you don't realize it, but he's, he's just died and, um, he thinks he's going to heaven, uh, because he come, walks into a kitchen and there are these awesome cookies there. Yay. Yeah. And the guy starts seeing, oh, these are the best cookies in the world. This is great. Yeah. And then he says, uh, where's the milk? And then the, the guy turns into a, um, uh, like a devil, you know, wearing horns and all that and says, milk, we don't have milk. Oh no! Yeah, do they have great. apple juice? App- Surprisingly, apple juice is but there was another a substitute. And I don't remember if this was like a, this is like an old uh, TV um, show called Outer Limits, or I think it was something like that. That um, did this one uh, short show, and it showed this guy, and he was like, a, Excuse me, he was kind of like a he was kind of like a, a hippie biker type or, or whatever. Mm-hmm. And he was wearing, you know, chain, you know, chain around his belt and, you know, looked really rough. And um, and he was in a waiting room and the devil was there. And he said, uh, and, he, the and he had just he had just died. And he was like, uh, he says, like, here I am. I'm ready to see hell and all the chains and fire and stuff like that. And, you oh. know, this is my kind of place. You know, when are we going to get there? And he says. Just wait, just wait. You'll be there. You know, we're just, we're just waiting in the time. And it turns out the other people in the room are like all these old ladies and old men that are like so boring and they keep telling him the same story and asking him questions and bothering him and he gets madder and madder and finally the devil comes no, back. And, and he says, man, you got to get me out of here. I'm ready to go on to hell. You know, where all the chains and the fire and the stuff. And the devil laughs and says, you are in hell. Oh, no. <laughs> so he's going to have to spend eternity with all these people he hates. <laughs> I mean, if, they had, if the old ladies had sugar snaps or, like, hard candy, I'd be okay, you know? But if they don't, I'd be serious. No, now. he was completely miserable. It was it was awesome. I mean, it was a big a big twist. It was awesome. It, yeah, a big twist. A big twist at the end. Very sad. Well, for nobody the would want to go there because you probably would get more than you bargained for. I probably sleep through the whole thing. But one of the things uh, that I discovered, and finally um, researching, well, I'll use air quotes around research. Research. Um, uh, William Blake was that. Uh, in the uh, marriage of heaven and hell, he has this great description of hell, and I'll read it to Did you. Did he go to hell? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That that was part of his story. He wrote it in in the form sort of similar to an epic poem. Remember uh, the epic poems wait, where the so the visit C.S. to Lewis, hell was okay. always yeah. So C.S. Lewis made this character named Blake, correct? No, we haven't even gotten to C.S. Lewis. What he said was that Blake wrote of the marriage of heaven and hell. Oh. And he says, I'm writing of its divorce. And we'll soon find out what he means oh. by it. Yeah. But that's what I'm saying, that Blake had this idea of a, an active hell that was part of everyone's lives. You know, the, mm-hmm. the peop- everyone down there was working together to, to basically be the opposite of, uh, of good. Yeah. Um, and uh, but he has this great description of hell that I thought I would uh, read to you. It's How does s- he know hell so well? Well, there have been different uh, uh, writers over the year uh, years who have tried to describe it. Uh, John Milton wrote Paradise Lost, and so it's an, an epic poem that is actually the story of how Lucifer was kicked out of heaven. And how he started his kingdom in hell. And there's a lot of fire and brimstone in oh, that. Oh, we need to read that. Huh? We should read that. It's a hard one, baby. I took it in college. It's hard. It's, 
There it is. He takes every uh, single book in college, man. Well, uh, if you're an English major... You have it, to. Yeah, you have to do that. You don't have to, but it makes you... It puffs you Modern. up a little bit. Yeah. So you can say, oh, did you take the Milton course? No. No. <laughs> That uh, was dumb. Yeah, so, you know, anyway. But it was a hard read. But um, it has the greatest line, one of the greatest lines about the devil, which is, better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. That was from uh, Milton. Yeah. I wouldn't but he say actually, he so. gave he gave uh, Lucifer a personality. You know, that was, uh, he, he actually, that was what was sort of groundbreaking about him. And and I guess I was just about to get into this, but C.S. Lewis, along with uh, that epic poem, and then also the other um, uh, uh, big epic poem that everyone points to regarding heaven and hell, is uh, Dante's Divine Comedy, and his last name uh, his, his last name was actually Alighieri. Can you say that with me, Dante Alighieri? Yes, and he it's actually, so weird. it took him 12 years to write it, and he got it published one year before his death. Isn't that awesome? And it's That's considered, crazy, man. It's considered one of the greatest poems um, ever written. Allegory. Yeah, and, and, and it is the story um, of uh, a, a first-person story of him going to hell, and he meets Virgil, the poet who was the great Roman poet. And Virgil wrote the story. Oh, sorry, Do you remember the story? You're not going to remember it. The story of the soldier of the soldier who left Troy and uh, took his family yeah. over. And remember, he fell in love with Dido. Oh, uh, yeah. And she flew her, threw herself off the wall when he was sailing away. Oh, uh, yeah. And then he went to hell. No, Dido loved loved him and yes he didn't but mutual yeah he did kind of love her but not enough to, like a sister not to probably. get over his quest to find his family his, no his new home no his, his wife died on the trip out are you sure yeah yeah he was not cheating son? on her i can't remember about the son thing um but anyway the, ultimately aeneas was his name and virgil's epic poem was the aeneid was oh, his yeah. story was his story of going to Italy and becoming the ancestor for the Roman Empire. So it was thought to be Virgil's way of connecting the Romans to the Greeks, you know, of um, uh, all all of the Greek mythology that we read. Uh, so um, uh, so it, you know, it actually includes a scene where he goes to hell and he sees Dido and he realized, remember, he was sailing away and he saw the lights all, uh, all lit up on the Great Wall and he didn't know, he thought it might be because he was escaping, but he found out that he met Dido and, and learned that she had thrown herself off the wall uh, in despair when he had left. And, and he went and met all these other great warriors from old times and, and all that. And um, so um, Dante, on the other hand, uh, meets Virgil, the poet, uh, mm -hmm. who was his great, uh, and this was hundreds of years later, and it was his great, um, 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 someone who that he looked up to. Oh. And, um, and Virgil takes him through hell and shows him the different uh, uh, circles of hell. So hell is, is divided up into different circles, and depending on how bad you were um, was where you were located within that. And then he, Virgil, takes him up to a place called Purgatorio, uh, which is, I don't know, have you ever heard of Purgatory? Yes. Do you know what it is? Jail. I'm saying No, it's, uh, it's actually like a waiting period. It's where, and this is oh. in the Catholic religion, which is why we haven't really talked about it mu that much, but they believe that there's a step in getting to heaven where the soul needs to be purified from all of the sin that it incurred through its life, uh, and um, so um, uh, so finally, and it's actually three books. So it's uh, Inferno. I know 
<laughs> I'm almost getting it. It's Inferno. No. <laughs> no. Don't. I'm Inferno, just tired. Purgatorio, and then finally Paradiso. It's almost 11, so. Do you know um, what Paradiso must be? No. Heaven. Oh. So he gives a glimpse, and he, he's... Um, he's has his wife Beatrice had died before, and so his wife Beatrice meets him in purgatory. In no, in purgatory, and leads him up uh, to heaven. Yeah, it's because he she was like this. Um, he and that's the other thing. It's one of the stories of great love is his love for Beatrice and her, how she was her his inspiration and and actually brought him to salvation. So. Um, so Blake actually referenced um, uh, uh, Virgil's work or Dante's work, and, and so it was in a way it was a play off of Dante's work. When when he went to hell, he found a completely different hell there. Um, and anyway, but anyway, it's a great description of hell, and I'll just read it before we start. By degrees, we. Uh, we beheld the infinite abyss, you know, which is a giant... Are the writers getting salty about everyone? What do you mean, salty? Never mind. Never mind. Um, fiery as the smoke of a burning city, beneath us, at an immense distance, was the sun, black but shining. Round it were fiery tracks on which revolved vast spiders, crawling after their prey, which flew, or rather swum, in the infinite deep, in the most terrific shapes of animals sprung from corruption, and the air was full of them, and it seemed composed of them. These are devils, and they are called powers of the air. I now asked my companion, he had a companion with him, uh, yeah. which was my eternal lot, so which was meant for me, and he said, between the black and white spiders. You didn't know there were spiders in hell, did you? But now... Um, from I mean, everyone's got a fear. He, he must have had A fear spiders, of spiders, spiders. Yeah. But now, from beneath... And that's what hell's about, where it's like, you will be punished for blah, blah, <laughs> blah, so you'll get fears. You'll be have to... You'll have to jump into a... Into off a high diving bridge that is filled with spikes, and you have to do it over and over oh, and yours? over. No. <laughs> Then why did you mention it? I don't why know. Did it just pop out of it's your head. It's random because some people <coughs> have fears of heights and jumping off stuff. On the spikes. Yes. But and spikes just make it worse because then you'll feel the pain and then you'll die and then you'll have to regenerate onto the bridge and you'll and there's no way down. But now from so, between, yeah. look, it gets worse. But now it gets worse. Between from between the black and white spiders, a cloud and fire burst and rolled through the deep blackening all beneath so that the nether deep oh grew black as the sea and rolled with a terrible noise. Beneath us was nothing now uh, to be seen but a black tempest, so a storm. A tempest. A tempest. Till, that sounds uh, so weird. Till looking tempest. east between the clouds and the waves, we saw a cataract of blood mixed cataract. with what fire. What is a cataract? A whirlpool. Oh. Yeah. Uh, you could have said whirlpool, but well, okay. Yeah, right. This was a long time ago when we wrote this. Um, yeah, the cataract of blood. You call it a whirlpool. Blood mixed with fire, oh. and not many stones thrown from us appeared, so not too far away, and sunk again the scaly fold of a monstrous serpent. At last, to the Ooh. east, distant to about three degrees, appeared a fiery crest above the waves. Slowly it reared like the ridge of golden rocks, till we discovered two globes of crimson fire, from which the sea fled away in clouds of smoke, and now we saw it was the head of a leviathan. Leviathan. Which is a sea serpent. Um, and his forehead was divided into streaks of green and purple, like those of a tiger's forehead. Huh. So, yeah, huh. And soon, see, wasn't it worth it? Soon we saw his mouth and red gills hang just above the raging foam. Yeah, Ten some people like, are afraid of tigers. <coughs> Tinging the black deep with beams of blood, advancing toward us with all the fury of a spiritual existence. 
My um fear, you know what my fear would be, and if if I went to hell, what? Being eaten by, um, being attacked by roses. <laughs> oh no, pollen. You're pollen right. and roses. You don't have allergies that bad. No, it's terrible, man. Hmm. My nose gets all clogged up, and it's terrible. So, um. So I will read a little bit more of the preface and I think you'll see where he's going. But what I can promise you is he gives a very unique vision of both heaven and hell. Okay? Got it. All right? It's going to blow you okay. away. It's, he is actually more, and he actually got the idea from reading a science fiction story. Cool. Which one? He couldn't remember the name of it. He had, well, he's about to say he'll explain it. C.S. Lewis, man. He'll explain it. He, well, he explains it in the end of his preface. He says, "He's like, oh yeah, it was yeah that, this one." He actually and says it. Sorry that right I'm here. messing up the mic. I'm sorry if this sounds weird in no, the no. microphone. I'm trying to fix it. Help! Yeah. I can't fix it because I have one. Oh no! I have one arm and with a baby, and then the other arm. He says first. Trying to fix it. All right. Okay. He says first. Okay. I must. I must acknowledge my debt to a writer whose name I have forgotten. And whom I read several years ago in a highly colored American magazine, he's British, by the way, um, of which they called sci Scientification. Hopefully you can hear me, by the way, because I put it on his sleeve. Scientific fiction. Uh, the unbendable and unbreakable quality of my heavenly matter was suggested to me by him, though he used the fancy for a different and most ingenious purpose. Ow. His hero traveled into the past and there, very properly, found raindrops that would pierce him like bullets and sandwiches okay, there go. that no strength could bite <sighs> because, of course, nothing in the past can be altered. I, with less originality, but I hope equal propriety, have transferred this to the eternal. If the writer of that story ever reads these lines, I ask him to accept my grateful acknowledgement. Well, he probably did. Uh, but then he, he probably he, died, actually. He ends it, he says, but the transmortal condition... Did, did C.S. Lewis die? Yeah, he's gone. Oh, okay. He was, I think he lived up until the 60s or so. Yeah. Maybe early 70s. Um, he must have, like, he must have a short memory. All right, and in the end, he says... But I, I also do so. In the end, he says, I beg readers to remember that this is a fantasy. Fantasy? It has, of course, or I intended it to have, a moral. Oh, and that's what I wanted, should have pointed out about allegories, uh -huh. is that they have a moral. There's the story, the most famous allegory is Pilgrim's Progress. Oh, yeah. And it's about, uh, the main character is called Everyman. Every so the, man for himself. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. No, it's every man is like, you can relate to this guy. And he meets all these people like Mr. Hateful and, and whatever. Mr. Happy. And so that's what you Mrs. look for. Glad. Yeah. And so Dante. Gade. Dante is also considered an allegory because it's not only just this journey, but it's a journey meeting all of these different souls and what their fate was finally met because huh. yeah so that's what i'm saying and that's the other thing about this book you'll see other characters other than the first person narrator and they all have problems and um and you know you can you can see a little bit of everyone's personality so huh. this unless and i'll just go ahead this is the last bit of english but i think you'll appreciate this most books are either plot driven you know what mm -hmm. a plot is it's like the story, right? Yeah. What's going to happen? Sure. Yes. So like a great example of a plot-driven story is Harry Potter. What's going to happen to Harry? Is He's he, when's not going to die. When is he, yeah, is he going to die? Is he, when's he going to fight Voldemort and all that? And, At the and they, last they have great book. characters, right? But the characters They are, all end up dying. All right, but here's my point. They, they have great characters, but they're not necessarily... Useful. The the whole the part. Main. Some of them, uh, you Ross, know. Ross. I mean, not Ross. No, what uh, am I thinking uh, of Ross? 
Uh, Dang it, Ron Hermi- and Hermione. Ron- right, right. So and, like sometimes we get to Neville, know them. Yeah, we get sometimes to- Jenny. Right, but we don't get to know many Jenny. of the characters very deeply. But we know unless you read the book. Yes, but nevertheless, that's probably an example of a plot driven. But then they have character driven, which a great example is Mrs. Bridge. Right, uh, it's a random series of stories about Mrs. Bridge. But what really makes the book is learning Mrs. Bridges' personality. Um, another example is, remember when we read uh, As I Lay Dying? Oh, and yeah. And Ants Bundren, remember the evil husband that just obviously didn't care? And um, Addie Bundren, the mother that, uh, you know, people thought was so good, but, you know, she also... Yes, yeah, well, she wanted to be out of there. She hated her life and all that, even though she felt obliged to be out there with that strange family. So, so anyway, and so this, on the other hand, is an allegory and it's designed to make you think. Huh. Yeah. yeah. So that's why I think you'll like it. So I mean, uh, well, I don't think that much, but okay. All right, I'll skip the rest of the preface. Okay. So just I'm give sure me a that little do bit you. of a rundown yeah. of the preface. Well, it's actually, it's pretty good, and it's only a couple of pages. Let me, let me start. It's hard to give it a rundown. The it's, first episode I can't really is say it any be better. Premise. Look, he'll say this. He talks about Hero to the Great Divorce. Um, this is not because I think myself a fit antagonist for so great a genius. So, so in other words, that's pretty ambitious to take on Blake. Okay, next page. Uh, not, yeah, all right, wait a minute. The attempt is based on the belief that reality never presents us with an absolutely unavoidable either or. That, granted skill and patience, and above all, time enough, some way of embracing both alternatives can always be found. The mere development or adjustment of refinement will somehow turn evil into good with good into evil. Without our being called on for a final and total rejection of anything that we would like to retain. This belief I take on to be a disastrous error. Okay? So I guess this is his main point. If I can find the first of the page. Hurry. I'm sorry. I'll edit it out. No, we're good. All right, we're good. Time wise too. We could Um, You cannot take oh listen to this. You cannot take all luggage with all luggage with you mm. on all journeys um, you have to drop off some books man on all journeys on one journey even your right hand and your right eye may be among the things that you have to leave behind what do you mean we I are gonna keep my right eye. well the bible said if thy right eye offend thee pluck it out we what? are n- we are not living in a... That's not what I think it's a reference to. We are not living in a world where all roads are radii of a circle, like putting it out from the middle. Oh, uh, funny story. And Can we're I... all, if followed long okay, enough... Wait, just listen. Okay. All, if followed long enough, will therefore gradually uh, draw near and finally meet at the center. Rather, in a world where every road... Uh, and this is the important part. Because this also makes me think of the road not taken. Um, oh, okay. In a, wor- in a world where every road, after a few miles, I'm so yawny. forks into two, and each of those into two again, and at each fork, you must make a decision. And even on the biolo- if I go straight? <laughs> even on the biological level, life is not like a river, but like a tree. Yeah. It does not move towards unity but away from it. And the creatures grow further apart as they increase in perfection. Good as it ripens becomes continually more different from um, not only from evil, but also from other good. So if that makes sense. See, did you catch any of that? Yes. Okay. Where is the microphone? Right oh, there. Okay. You're fine. I do not think that all who choose wrong roads perish, but their rescue consists of it being put back on the right road. A sum can be put right, but only by going back. So when you're adding, you're like you're adding a bunch of numbers and it yes. turns out wrong. Yes. 
right? Um, but only go by going back until you find the error and working it afresh from that point. Never by simply like spelling mistakes. Like, never by simply going on. In other words, if you have a mistake in math, you can't just keep going on. Or spelling mistakes. Yeah, or spelling. I don't think math. I like the analogy with math better for some reason. I like the spelling because um, if you were sending somebody a text and it when you messed up like literally everything, mm -hmm. and it was a very long text, and it's just like, can you go to jail tonight? By accident. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. It's very weird and confusing to the other person, and you're, and then you have to explain it. All right, listen to this. Okay. See, see if you agree or disagree. Evil can be undone, but it cannot develop into good. Uh, I mean, yeah. You can. Time does not heal it. The spell must be uh, unwound bit by bit with backwards mutters of deserving power. Or not, or else not. It is still either or. If we keep keep insisting, if we insist on keeping hell or even earth, we shall not see heaven. If we accept heaven, we shall not be able to retain even the smallest and most intimate souvenirs of hell. I believe to be sure that any man who reaches heaven will find what he abandoned even in plucking out his right eye and uh, that has not and it has not been lost that the kernel of what he was really seeking even in his most depraved wishes will be there beyond expectation waiting for him in the high countries in that sense it will be true for those who have completed the journey and uh for no others to say that good is everything and heaven is everywhere. Okay, I got scared my, my cat died, but it's fine. Okay. <laughs> We're good. But we, at this end of the road, must not try to anticipate that retrospective vision. If we do, we are likely to embrace the false and disastrous co converse and fancy that everything is good and everywhere is heaven. That's not true, right? No. But what you but ask. That's not true. But what you Unless ask. Unless you're in like heaven itself. And what. And it is heaven. Right. But And what you ask of earth. Earth, I think, will not be found by anyone. Earth is heaven and hell. But. Earth. Earth, I think, will not be found by anyone to be, in the end, a very distinct place. Yeah. I think earth, if chosen instead of heaven will turn out to have been all along only hell. a only a region in hell. Yep. Uh, and earth, if put second to heaven, to have been from the beginning a part um, of heaven itself. Well, that ends it here. Thank you for joining us. Um, thank you, Dad, for reading. And we'll see you next time on The Great Divorce. Bye. <laughs>